Well, good morning. Well underway here this morning. Bagged up a couple bags of feed. Got 350 gallons of water in there. Some Amigo. Now we're just pumping the Liberty into our chem handler. Need a hundred and some liters of that. And then the last one that we add is the uh, Centurion. So spraying 10 gallons because I'm weak. <clears throat> and by that I mean I'm not a I'm not a twice the water twice the kill guy. I don't I don't buy into that. When we sprayed with our <clears throat> sprayer sprayer, we used to spray at two and a half gallons an acre. Then we got the self-propelled and people for years had already been saying, oh no, you gotta be doing you gotta be doing 10, you gotta be doing five, you gotta be doing seven and a half, you gotta be doing 12 or 15. So for folks that came from two and a half gallons, we're like, why? Why so much water? Why all the water? Oh, twice the water, twice the kill. Then they get into, oh, you can't dilute the chemical, which doesn't make sense to me, but that's what they tell us. So if you're not familiar with, with ag spraying, I, I can't actually remember, this is 1.37 liters per acre, I think, or something. <clears throat> so the theory behind this more water thing is it doesn't matter how much water you put down. You could put 100 liters of water an acre, as long as you have 1.3 or whatever it is, I think 1.35 maybe, I don't know, liters of Liberty going with it. So when we used to spray at two and a half gallons, we put two and a half gallons of water over the whole acre. And in that two and a half gallons of water, there was 1.3 liters of, of Liberty. Now they're saying, oh, put on, put on 10 gallons and only put 1.3. So you can, the, the solution itself is a lot more diluted, right? We used to have to try to put in 160 acres of chemical into one 400 gallon tank. Now we're putting 80 liters of chemical into an 800 gallon tank. No, sorry, 80 acres. We used to put 160 acres worth of chemical into 400 gallons of water. Now we're putting 80 acres of chemical into 800 gallons of water and expecting the same results. And I mean, I know, I know I'm not gonna win this one. It's just, it is what it is. Everybody, almost, almost everybody is just right on board with twice the water, twice the kill, more water, more water, more water. But anyways, I am not, however, a lot of the books are saying, you know, recommend or minimum water recommendations. So we're just going with what the book says and, and being, being good farmers. So that's what we're doing here. You can sure get a lot done if you only spray, like if you were to spray two and a half gallons, though, you could spray like what? You could spray a half section on a tank. It'd be amazing. Now we're spraying 80 acres on a tank. So another thing I've been struggling with is trying to get, trying to keep this chemical from foaming up. And I'm not sure what other folks are doing, but I, uh, I found if I let any air go into that venturi down here that sucks the chemical out of the handler and puts it in the sprayer, then right away I got bad, bad foam in the tank. That fitting on the tank yesterday on the Toyota chemical was actually, it didn't fit tight, didn't make a tight seal. So yesterday I had this unbelievable foam until I fixed that. And uh, I've struggled with Liberty in the past. I was online looking at a couple of, uh, a couple of forums, trying to see what guys were doing, but it just seems like the warmer the better, so if you can leave your coat out in the sun and even your water, get your water a little bit warmer, fill it up the night before sort of a thing. That seems to help. Of course, halt. I put quite a bit more halt than I normally do in. Uh, big into filling the tank, at least half full of water first, and then stopping everything, filling the chem handler and all that stuff, and then getting the rest of the chemical added, because you can't even, uh, last year, when I, and when I left the agitator in the tank going, I actually couldn't even spray it. It got so frothy. I had to, uh, actually had to stop and wait. It was unbelievable. So now that I'm just topping it up, I, uh, this is our, this is our, our, our spraying system. And it's incredible too. 
So my buddy from up north there, we were chatting the other day about, you know, maybe the uh, going a little overboard with ag. You know, maybe the, some of the equipment's too big or too fancy or whatever. So when we got this sprayer, we sold our older spray air branded model sprayer. We think we sold that sprayer for fifteen hundred dollars. This chem handler alone, I think, cost like thirteen hundred when we bought it. We did have the trailer. We did buy a bigger tank because we only had a four hundred gallon water tank to feed our four hundred gallon sprayer. Sprayer. And then we bought this chem pump, and we needed some fittings, right? So it's actually pretty easy now. Filling up goes pretty quick. You go. Uh, you can hook up to whatever tote you need and either pump it in or you can suck it in with that chem handler. It's also got blades inside, so instead of opening every jug and dumping it, trying to triple rinse, you stab the jug over top of the blades and then up through the blades, shoots a jet of water to rinse the jugs. That's quite a bit more efficient than what we used to do. And then uh, we rigged it so the pump pumps directly into it, so you don't have any, you actually don't have to have any exposure to chemicals if you don't want to. Shot. Just flip the switches, turn it on. Now we can't fill as fast as those big dash trailers. We can't carry as much product as those big tra dash trailers, but we don't need to. So in our farming area, we, you know, you don't see a lot of intense sprayer applications. We, like guys aren't out spraying, you know, 40 times a year trying to top dress this and spray that. So at least not yet, anyways. I might get there with my uh, my little molasses. Box and I might end up doing some more, some more spraying than I normally do, but we'll see. Oops. Well, good morning. It actually smells like rain yet this morning, but it's not uh, not raining yet. And holy man, was it cold! Yesterday was cold. I actually put on two jackets yesterday. Unbelievably cold. So it's been a few days since uh, any footage here. We've been plugging away at things, so. My father-in-law actually built the swing set for the kids. He brought it over and we set that up the other day. And then we shifted over and started the uh, treehouse project over the weekend here. So it is Sunday morning. I am gonna run out and spray a couple quarters of cereals, but the treehouse is coming along. So I'm not sure. Uh, what the kids have in mind for like a 100% design but uh, I know they wanted they wanted to keep going up and that's already uh what seven basically 15 feet to that platform up there and then they got that much further to go so I hope I hope we're done at this platform we uh <clears throat> I don't know I'm not a carpenter, so <clears throat> we uh, we didn't get her straight when we put these power poles in. And then when we put the frame around, it was like a square that had been like squished a little bit. So like a square, you know, a square that had tilted like that. So then, of course, all your, all these don't line up. But it's okay because... Uh, they got whole areas like crazy town and stuff at amusement parks where everything's built sideways and crooked and it still functions so that'll work <clears throat> so i guess their plan is uh railing around the bottom with a slide and like a rock wall to climb up and then at the top we're gonna build walls and a roof we were debating on making a flat roof and then railings around that too because that'll be another seven feet up so i'll be 21 feet and then they can have their little observation deck up top there it's starting to be way more of a project than i uh thought it was going to be but if everything goes south i guess i can move in there oh we also got uh what do we got yesterday saturday that was crazy we had like which was good though because we had everybody come to pick up their bags which we've got sitting in various spots around outside and uh <clears throat> i didn't want to have to shove them all back in the shed because we're supposed to get rain tomorrow excuse me in the next day so 
few totes of molasses went out. Lots of guys are, the guys with their own pasture anyways, they're thinking that this fly control might just be the answer to, first of all, reducing or eliminating the fly problem. And second of all, increasing the longevity of their pastures. So while we do have cloudy skies, so the puddles and the rains we've been getting are sticking around. The grass in the yards and stuff is growing quite lush. My neighbor was here yesterday picking up a couple bags of barley because he's just short about 3,000 pounds. Um, he said the the grass in the yards are, is growing nice, but the grass in the pastures is slow to come. So hopefully, hopefully we do get some more rain for those folks. We can use it too. We can always use a splash of rain in our country. But for now, let's fire up old Marvin the sprayer here because we didn't, uh, I didn't even get it cleaned out since we did Liberty. I'm a big oil checker. Do you guys check your oil every single day? I check it every day, every, well, before I, every, every time before I fire up the machine. And I had, uh, I don't think <clears throat> there's a system where engine oil runs through a different avenue. But on our Kenworth, the coolant runs through an inner cooler for the transmission as well. So one day I had, uh, just fire this up quick. I checked the, uh, checked the oil, checked the coolant and everything in the morning. And the coolant was down like, I don't know, two, three liters. And I thought, well, that's very, very strange. So I, uh, I left it run for a while to warm up and then I came out and I was looking again and I didn't even add any coolant to it because there was no coolant on the ground but there was no coolant in the tank either so I thought well this is very very strange not being mechanic or understanding what potentially happened I just started looking and looking and then through the top of the transmission I'm assuming some sort of a vent or something there was all this frothy yellow milky grossness oozing out of the top of the transmission so I uh, messaged a couple of people and they're like, oh, looks like maybe your intercooler. And what had happened overnight, that was a winter, a winter day. I guess maybe it was so hot and then rusty inside. And then as it froze, it actually broke the intercooler inside. So it dumped all the coolant into the transmission. So that was fun. And then I was talking to a buddy about it after and he was saying like, He'd never really heard of a case where a guy caught it before it went the other way. Because I caught it when the coolant went from the from the in, in the radiator and the coolant tank down into the transmission. He said if you would have drove and everything would have pressured up, you would have pumped oil into your radiator and then through your engine that way. And then you know, then you gotta flush. I mean we flush everything anyways, but then you gotta flush it all again. So or more thoroughly or whatever. So anyways, I always check things because things fail overnight. I guess that was the moral for that long ass rant. <laughs> 